I'm here to introduce and begin the Ohio River Anthology, a series of short skits modeled after the Spoon River Anthology, a series of epitaphs published by Edgar Lee Masters in 1915. My pick companions and I may appear quite widely, but I assure you that we are returning from our graves to share this history. This history is a little disjointed in places, but I think when you consider all of us together, you get the general flow of the nearly 200 year old Universalist congregation, initially known as the first Universalist Society since then, and currently incarnated as Heritage Universalist Unitarian Church, where many of you have spent time in these past two days in fellowship. My name is John Hanson. It's wonderful to return since May to speak with you. And though much has changed in the century and a half since I last walked these streets, let me tell you a little bit about my life's passion. Public education for children. I understand that the work which took over 20 years getting laws passed to fund public education for all children from taxes has withstood the test of time. Well done. It was a challenge to lose the first earnings of those wealth dues in order to educate the common children. They even burned me an effigy when I suggested everyone deserves an education and we should all be responsible for paying for it. <laughs> While I was working with Nathan Guilford and others to get a school tax, I was teaching a small school on Main Street between 5th and 6th. I was one of just a few schools where students could pay a few dollars for three or four months of education in reading, writing, and arithmetic. I know a few dollars doesn't sound like much today. I can't believe we pay as much for a gallon of milk as we pay for several months of school, but I'll leave that there. I had the, the good fortune to spend 20 years in teaching in the public school system after fighting so hard to get it. My little Emma, the youngest of my children, became a teacher in the Cincinnati school system as well. Cincinnati was a good place to raise a family in those times. My lovely wife, Margaret, and I had ten children. We raised them all in the Universalist state. We had such wonderful friends in the Universalist church. A group of us founded what was referred to in the Cincinnati Historical Society books as the first Universality Society of Cincinnati. <laughs> Our congregation met in a courthouse, a schoolhouse, and many other locations around Cincinnati. We grew in numbers, changed ministers several times, always working to keep a minister with us. But they were often pulled away to spread universalism. Josiah Crosby Waldo, son in law of the great universalist leader Josiah Ballou, was one of the first ministers. George Rogers was a dear friend who served as our minister for a year but helped make great strides in having a home in the Mechanics Institute on Walnut between 3rd and 4th Streets. William Yett, <coughs> excuse me, William West and that John <coughs> Gurley succeeded Rogers, the church grew like wildfire. The First Universalist Society of Cincinnati remained a major source of support and fellowship for me until my death in 1862. There is another family with a legacy First Universalist named Carrie. I knew William Carrie. Our children grew up together in religious education classes. I will now introduce you to the Carrie sisters who became well known in their own right and bid you a fond farewell. <coughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
excuse our informal and somewhat ghostly attire, but it would just be unfair to be both dead and expected to wear a corset in Victorian attire. <laughs>
harbors and yes in the front, name of you. And they were noticed and acclaimed by well-known folks like Edgar Allan Poe and Horace Ritchie. And we started making money off of our writing. Scandalous! <laughs> <laughs> and we never married. Even more scandalous! <laughs> well, there were some opportunities. I was quite in love with one young man, but his prosperous parents didn't find me acceptable. They're lost. Eventually, we left Cincinnati, I first. And me a few years later, and we made our new home in New York City. <coughs> Sometimes our lack of much formal education made us feel a little inferior in the bustling city of New York. But we still held Sunday salons, and we actually became pretty well known in literary circles. We also became pretty well known in the early movement for women's rights. Many of Alice's books depicted stories about women's struggles with inequality, and many of her heroines were self-confident women who remained true to themselves rather than bowing to societal expectations. And Phoebe was even more vocal in her support. For a short time, she was even the assistant editor of The Revolution, a newspaper published by Susan B. Anthony. Oh, but my dear Alice became increasingly crippled in her later years and suffered much pain. Mm -hmm. You cared for me so lovingly, though, dear sister. Even though you were not truly well yourself, and gave up so much to take care of me in those final months. When Alice finally left this world in 1870, she died in her sleep. Her pallbearers included P.T. Barnum and Forrest Greeley. Mm -hmm. My dear Phoebe, should not have grieved so heavily. Phoebe became severely depressed after my passing, and her health failed quickly. She joined me only six months later. Her obituary summed up both our beliefs. It stated, her religious sentiments were deep and strong, her faith in the eternal goodness unwavering. Educated in the faith of universalism, she believed to the last in the final salvation of all of God's children. Well, thank you very much for indulging and letting us tell our story. And I'd like to leave you with a few parting thoughts and tell you that in your packet of information, and there's one of my poems called Suppose, that I hope you will enjoy when you get a chance. And I'd also like to leave you with the words of another poem called When Lovely Woman. When lovely woman wants a favor and finds 